Hey, hey, hey. Perfect. Well, thanks for coming back, and um, um, we'll get started here. Um, if you're ready to roll, uh, we've got Danny Chun, Principal Software Engineer, Northrop Grumman, and he'll be talking about digital interoperability for containers using DevOps tools. So take it away. All right. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so you bet. Uh, topic, topic for today is uh, digital interoperability for containers uh, using DevOps tools. So before I begin, let me just give you a quick bio on myself. I've uh, been a software developer for over nine years now. Um, in the last nine years, I've taken on a variety of different roles. Uh, software developer, front-end, back-end engineer, system admin, system system software integrator, tester, and now a uh, DevSecOps engineer. It's been primarily in the DOD space, so interesting experience. Um, I have a bachelor's in computer science from San Diego State. Um, currently, I'm working on cloud integration. And what that is, is for me, just the adoption of leveraging cloud-based services with existing tools and applications and seeing where that fits. Uh, some of it can involve lesson shifting of existing apps, as well as uh, identifying where existing apps may fit. Um, additionally, uh, DevSecOps has best practices in place. Uh, and what that entails is identifying where implementing uh, standardized CI, CD, which is continuous integration, continuous delivery systems uh, make sense. Uh, providing awareness of static dynamic uh, code analysis tools and keeping a security component in mind when working with uh, development teams uh, with their software development life cycle. Uh, hobbies outside of work, is traveling, big traveler, um, haven't had the opportunity to do some international in a while, um, but last time I was in uh, Vermont, and I didn't know it at the time, but it is the hometown of uh, where Ben and Jerry ice cream was born. So I had the pleasure of visiting that factory, and it was it was great. Um, I enjoy hiking, cooking. Love to cook. On that note, let's kind of go over today's agenda. Um, I'm going to be talking uh, about definitions, uh, in particular data interoperability, what is DevSecOps, and how that kind of fits in this topic here. Um, next, container-focused uh, container discussions. We're going to do some kind of the history of containers and, and talk a little bit more about what a container is. Afterwards, we're going to do a deep dive into some tools that we can use um, for containerization and how that kind of fits with the data and operability. Afterwards, we're gonna go into a case study, two in particular, and finally, uh, if time allows for it, some questions. So, definition time. Uh, data and operability, what is it? So I just pulled this definition off of dataandoperability.org, and I'll just go ahead and read out loud. It's the ability of systems and services that create, exchange, and consume data to have clear, shared expectations for the content, context, and meaning of that data. So me just putting on my developer hat, I'm just thinking, oh, you know, this to me reads as a clear and present understanding of the data for, for whatever resource that may be. Again, with a develop, dev hat in mind, that, that simply means to me, having a clearly defined API calls, a schema that that is consistent, and maybe in the terms of a developer, uh, appropriate coding standards in, in place. Now, how does that kind of play into containers? Well, with containers, you have you have standards that are really key. Uh, one important standard is the OCI uh, standard, which is the Open Container Initiative. Um, it has two particular specifications involved in that. 
which is the runtime specification as well as the image specification. What that kind of means is that how you kind of create your image is determined by that specification as well as how you kind of uh, spin up and spin down that image. I'll talk a little bit, I'll talk in detail more about that as we go into that discussion on containers. Um, identifying backwards compatibility. So it's important with containers at least, if, if you're working with containers, maybe as part of your requirements to consider that. Um, and also usage in general, where does it make sense to kind of add, uh, add value with containers? So for some organizations, for some teams, containers may be a fairly new concept. So making sure that a clear understanding of what a container is and how that kind of fits into your data exchange um, is something to keep in mind. All right. Um, moving on to a definition of DevSecOps. Um, just pulled this one from IBM. I thought they had a pretty good example. Um, it's the integration of security throughout your software development lifecycle. Initial design, integration, testing, deployment, and software delivery. I think in the last couple of days, there has been discussion on you know, that definition of DevStar Ops. Um, I think it's, it's a pretty good um, indicator across the board with some of the data points presented previously. And that that star can represent everything in between that gives that added value to DevOps. In this context here, I'll just focus on kind of that security aspect that we embed DevOps into the software development lifecycle. Some examples of how this kind of plays a role with interoperability. One, configuration management. So kind of knowing what is the what is the application or what is the product that's being delivered and how are you managing it? Having standardization of your continuous integration, continuous delivery pipelines. Um, finally, kind of having a, a knack for ensuring that you continue to do automation when possible throughout your design process or whatever type of uh, development you have going on. Perfect. So let's let's talk about uh, the containers and kind of the history of containers. So before I kind of go over, uh, we'll, we'll first kind of take a trip down memory lane and start in the beginning. So in 1979, uh, during the development of the OS system Unix version 7, the operation CH root was kind of introduced. And what that kind of offered was the ability to modify a root working directory uh, for the prop for a process as well as its children and limit access to the rest of the file system. It really introduced the concept of this idea called process isolation. At a high level, what that means is a uh, process is kind of in jail and locked away from the rest of the world. In this case, the rest of the file system. Close to kind of two decades later, in 2000, FreeBSD expanded on that concept and actually named a system call that they created um, called Jails, and it was folded into the operating system. Part of the motivation for this actually came from a hosting company, and they were looking for a way to kind of handle their system and administrative uh, functions for their customers. And to do that, they kind of brought in this jailed aspect, which brought an additional layer of isolation. Skipping to 2006, um, some of us may be familiar with this, uh, Google introduced the concept of C groups, which kind of introduced the isolation of resources, um, CPU, memory, disk IO, network, uh, which was eventually folded into the Linux kernel. It was quite a game changer in the time, in that you could literally impose limits on whatever process app you had going on, let's say like a shared uh, server. Jumping to 2008, um, LXE was introduced, which is very similar to what we know today as containers. 
it brought in the concept of C group that Google introduced, which is that isolation of resources, as well along with Linux namespacing. And what that really allowed for was the concept of having multiple Linux systems running on a single host environment. Sounding a lot like Docker at this point, without actually saying it's a container. But moving on, 2013, Docker actually came out and the idea of containers became a little more well known in that it offered a fairly comprehensive solution for container management. It helped in that at the time, it also brought in a fairly uh, easy to use UI, as well as having a strong community following that year. Onward with that popularity, um, you can kind of see the vast number of container management solutions that are now out there. Uh, you have Kubernetes, Docker Swarm, Rancher, uh, OpenStack, to name a few, that continues to build on this containerization idea. And you can see how it's slowly or quickly being uh, adopted across various organizations, various teams, for their kind of workflows. All right, let's talk a little bit now about the makeup of a container. So I'll give a quick definition. Um, a container is a software package that's completely patched up all its dependencies or self-contained that allows your application to run quickly and reliability from one computing environment to another. In the case of a Docker container, uh, you, you can think of it as a lightweight VM has everything needed to run the application, all the way from code, runtime, system tools, and configuration. So on the left-hand side, uh, you'll see a diagram, and that shows three running applications. Um, under the hood of that, you'll see the Docker engine, and the Docker engine is, is uh, follows a, a specific set of uh, specifications for getting those containers that you see there, app one, app two, and three, up and running. I talked about this OCI standard, and that's kind of what Docker engine is conforming to under the hood. As one of the many contributors to that standard, they follow this under the hood as a, as a tidbit. It runs an application called Run C, which is an implementation of the OCI runtime specification responsible for creation and running of those container processes. On the right hand side, I wanted to kind of showcase an analogy for the VMs and containers just through the use of houses and apartments. In the house, on the left-hand side, you'll see a bit, you have a building, normally everything within it. You have the roof, some bedrooms, bathroom, kitchen, living room, etc. cetera. As, the, as a house owner, you're responsible for everything in that building. Now, let's move on to the containers. In, a, in the container example here, you have an apartment. Uh, in the apartment, um, you may you you have a building you go into. Not all of the building is yours. You might have a one bed one bath arrangement. In this case, you might be sharing a wall, a roof, a yard, some of your other tenants. You're only responsible for what is inside your particular apartment, not in the entire building itself. So, in the context of a container, this would be just your application and all its dependencies you need to run it. Not having to worry about the OS level installation, the memory management, hard disk, CPU, and so forth. That's taken care of from the underlying runtime specifications. Jumping back to the house, well, you have not only the responsibility for the application, but you got the OS level um, installation that you're responsible for the memory management, hard disk management, CPU, and so forth, since you don't have 
that, that underlying um, component that a container might have. The takeaway I wanted to kind of break out from this uh, diagram here is uh, containers allow kind of decoupling of the application level component and the infrastructure level components, which really opens the doorway for many different use cases um, for, for software development life cycles. And I'll show a few examples uh, in, in the next coming slides. So let's go into talking about a actually a managed solution that um, Amazon offers. So Amazon offers a managed solution called Elastic Container Registry. It's a fully managed uh, registry solution that allows you to store, manage, share, and deploy your container images and artifacts. What makes it kind of nice is that it one, it's it plays well with a lot of the other AWS services uh, for utilizing for utilization. Um, it comes in. It, you can use it via API calls. You can use it with the web console. Um, what I want to talk before I kind of dive into this is kind of what that component is comprised of. One. You have the registry. Uh, the registry is just provided to every account holder. That allows you to just create, store your image repositories. You have the actual repo, uh, which is the storage of your images. You have your registry policy, access control for the registry. And then you have the images themselves. So one thing that's kind of nice about ECR is that if you actually look at another service that Amazon offers, uh, AWS Artifacts, you can actually see the resources for compliance reports. Uh, for some of the DOD customers, uh, you, one thing that I found that was kind of nice to know was that ECR is a FedRAMP, FedRAMP compliant at the moderate and high level. So if you were in the AWS GovCloud, this kind of helps um, for proposals in, in knowing that there is compliance already in place for some of those uh, AWS resources. And once again, that was um, AWS artifacts that you can look for any compliance report that for any of the services here. Um, before I kind of dive out of this slide deck, um, how does payment work for this using the service? Um, you don't pay an upfront cost. It's one thing I found that was kind of nice is that you pay one for the data that you store on here. Um, typically, it's about 10 cents per gig uh, a month for any data stored on this particular managed service. And then you pay for the data transfer out. So anything out of the AWS web servers out, outside of its uh, and prices vary um, as as time goes on. So let's talk about um, Packer now and how that kind of relates to containers. One, let's Packer is a open source tool and allows for creation of machine images for multiple platforms from a single source configuration, and that's kind of nice because it opens a lot of different use cases. You can have the idea of creating one image that's mirrored across different environments. That's perhaps an example of a parity. You might have a dev, a test, and a prod environment. And wouldn't it be nice to kind of have something that kind of allows you to uh, create identical, exact duplicate images across the board? Um, on the left-hand side, I'll kind of explain that diagram here. It's, you'll see Packer in the middle, and then all the bubbles around it is the different builders that you can make use of to generate an image for. So um, let's start at AWS here. 
if you use Packer and then you use the builder AWS, you have the ability to now provision a, the, their equivalent of an image, which is an AMI, um, using the Packer language. Docker, if you use Docker as your builder, you now have the capability of provisioning and running a container, provisioning and creation of a container um, via Docker. And it works for a whole ton of different uh, builders out there. More being added over time. Um, the last I looked about two days ago, I counted at least 10 different builders available. And the community base is growing uh, at, a, at a pretty quick amount. Um, so how this kind of relates to interoperability is that I think it makes it quite a handy tool for configuration management of your images or containers. It provides one, a repeatable manner that allows you to plug into an existing pipeline, especially for when it comes to hardening an image. Use, used in conjunction with like Chef or Ansible, you can really do quite a bit with this tool with respect to uh, handling your pre and post configurations within an image or a container and have it all version controlled. I wanted to kind of show the, uh, the picture on the right hand side just because I thought it was a really nice, simple workflow. So one of the challenges I've seen in the past is this idea of a golden AMI where you want to have uh, assurance that you have some semblance of an image or a container that uh, meets certain security requirements. And one, wouldn't it be nice to kind of have a way to, to visualize that and have a consistent manner in doing so? Packer kind of offers some of that capability to do so. So assume you kind of have Packer in, in your workflow. You can kind of see here where if you had Packer, you, you have the ability to perhaps maybe build your initial image, put in your put in your uh, modifications to kind of harden that image, um, and go and see, you know, maybe I want to go ahead and validate this. Maybe you'll have some um, human intervention here to take a look at that container, or you might have some kind of automated work uh, pipeline that checks on that container, which I'll be talking about in a case study in a moment, um, that checks on that hardened image and sees does it actually meet what your requirements are at the time? And so, uh, depending on that case, if it's if it's acceptable by one your your human inter interface or your automated tool, then it'll go into in a, perhaps an approved state. And then from there, perhaps it goes into uh, another state where you actually push all of your um, your your blessed uh, AMIs. And, and finally, uh, let's assume that, you know, once you push it out to your blessed AMIs, let's see if you can go ahead and distribute that uh, across to your various consumers. And then eventually over time, you need to repeat that process. So having some kind of workflow, especially with an example here with Packer, Kind of allows that to kind of come into the picture and have uh, a discussion and a talking point for for golden AMIs. All right. Let's dive into kind of the next uh, topic, and here's kind of where I wanted to talk about how containers could be used in the context of a micro microservice application and where DevOps tools can kind of help bridge some of the gaps that uh, a manual process might uh, bring challenges to. So on the left hand side, you see GitHub, uh, which is a source repository. Um, that's kind of where you are able to kind of store your various source codes, 
your Docker files artifacts. On the bottom left hand side, you'll see Docker Hub, which is a registry, um, container registry solution um, that allows you to kind of store your container registries, uh, both for public and private containers. And going to the idea of microservices here, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the full workflow. So in the middle, you see Jenkins, which acts as your uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment uh, application maestro. Uh, for the continuous integration portion, um, feeding in from your source code as well as from your containers, you could have Jenkins in this exact context here perform your compilation, your building, execution of unit tests, smoke tests, provisioning environment, and moving packages, um, artifacts, containers uh, from that uh, built pipeline all the way out into your particular uh, target environment. And that's where the CI, the CD comes into play. Kind of Jenkins, you have that continuous deployment capability where you can, one, kind of log into your host environments, uh, pull up, pull the images that you just literally created uh, from your CI pipeline and push it out and see how that uh, microservice works in a in an environment, whether that's your prod, your test, or, or dev environment. All right, let's talk about our first case study. So, one, how can containers be used to kind of solve this manual vulnerability scanning? Um, there, was a, there was an interesting um, uh, study, or there was an interesting uh, project where a, the idea of containers were uh, we had a requirement where a secure where we had containers that needed to uh, meet certain security requirements before entering an environment. And wouldn't it be nice for a moment to think about a way to kind of automate this? So I'm going to go over kind of what that requirement was at the time. So still for a moment, you had a security team um, that for any containers that entered an environment, it must meet certain requirements, such as having no CV criticals, high findings, the antivirus scan, have been ran under uh, some tools, X, Y, Z, and have no critical findings and being hardened for some kind of requirement. Kind of hearing that, it sounds like a pretty good opportunity to kind of automate where possible and that's kind of where I think some helpful DevOps tools can come into play. Kind of going with what I just said for that security requirement, can we perhaps standardize that security requirement, perhaps in the form of security policy? Let's assume yes in this context here. Now, instead of manually hand running each of the tools that the uh, security team kind of required, uh, and validating the results, uh, pushing over the results and reports over to uh, the security team, uh, wouldn't it be nice to have some kind of repeatable process that doesn't kind of rely on someone kind of actually doing it each and every time manually? And I think that's where some of the added value of having DevOps tools come into play here. One, it kind of allows you to standardize the process, uh, perform a kind of compliance-driven workflow, and again, create that repeatable process. So in this diagram here, I have an example of a possible uh, compliance-driven workflow with a Docker file as your input. Uh, for that code portion, that could very well be your container source code such as a Docker file that's stored in whatever source repo that um, you're, you're choosing, GitHub, code commit, TFS. Uh, for the CI CD portion, 
That could be Jenkins, Bamboo, Team City. That will be performing some of the actions later in this diagram here. For the staging repo, you can define your, your build and stage uh, pipeline that kind of builds that Docker file that creates your image and pushes it into a staging repo in preparation for scanning. Next on that um, comes the meat and potato of kind of this compliance driven workflow. And that's kind of where that image scanning pipeline comes into play. With this pipeline, it could simply pull down the image from the staging repo and perform just a variety of different scans across that container based on the security requirements that you had before. Once those scans are complete, now you have a series of scan results that you can do some post processing in and compare the results with the security policies, policies that you developed uh, with your security team. From there, based on the results, perhaps you define a, uh, a pass gate, um, in this example here, that if perhaps 90% of the security policy are met, the container gets promoted and pushed to prod, along with a report card that shows that the container does indeed meet some of those security requirements laid out. Otherwise, the pipeline simply fails and goes back um, to that entire CI CD process once again um, to iterate through. As I kind of described this workflow, it is quite involved, um, especially with setting up and getting it right the first time. But I think the payoff is huge in terms of standardization repeatability, and traceability That's, that can only just pay future dividends if designed well. So. Here's an example. Yeah, of, uh, sorry about breaking in here. We've got about five minutes left on your presentation time. So if you want to entertain questions, we'll just have to leave a few minutes for that. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. All right. I'm gonna go ahead and yeah, I'll quickly go over this and then I'll break away for questions. So here, here's an example of a report card uh, from that, from setting up that possible um, security compliance pipeline. And one thing I kind of like about it is that it's pretty high level in that now you have a traceable artifact that you can have kind of in place uh, one for uh, compliance, uh, configuration manage, management, and a standardized kind of report um, through and through as you continue on with uh, additional containers that you may add into the into your workflow. Um, looks like my time is a little uh, short, so I'll go ahead and just cut it away to um, questions now. All right, thanks, Danny. Good job.